Hello. Uh, I'm Carolina, and this is Alfredo. We are working for Red Hat at RGO Project, and we would like to talk about OpenStack RGO deployment on community distribution of Kubernetes. Uh, what is RGO? Very short, uh, because Joel already uh, took some words about it. Uh, this is an RDO distribution of OpenStack. If you would like to hear some more details about it, I made a presentation last year on the Connect, so we can find it on YouTube. It's very detailed about the OpenStack there. Uh, uh, sorry, RDO there. But for very short, uh, we are a community supported distribution. Now we mainly support CentOS Stream 9. Previously, we were based on CentOS Stream 8, CentOS 8. Currently, the, I think we still have a yoga based on, uh, built on CentOS Stream 8, but both with 9. Uh, but then we moved on to a, to a 9. And this is the distribution we mainly, uh, mainly support. Uh, this is because we are following the OpenStack release cycle, which means new release every six months. So now we released Bobcat, and the next release, Caracal, is in development now. We provide two different sets of repositories for a different purposes. First of them is RGO Trunks, which is our continuous delivery distribution. And the second one is CloudSeq. But since the deliverables is our main goal, we still need some, uh, some way to test it and deploy it. OpenShift is now a very versatile project and very intensively developed. So we decided to make some efforts to prepare RDO deployment on open source Kubernetes called OKD. So I will hand over to Alfredo, who will introduce you to some engineering beside that topic. Thanks, Carolina. So uh, the topic, this topic is, is probably the biggest changes that has happening in the Red Hat ecosystem, let's say, on the enterprise Linux ecosystem in OpenStack, and it's actually more related to the operational side of OpenStack than to OpenStack uh, functionality itself. So the first thing uh, I would like in this presentation is to explain what the problem that we are trying to fix and what, why this change is happening now. So first thing is we need to admit that managing OpenStack is not easy, as any, I don't know if there is any OpenStack admin in the room, at least one. So uh, actually it has become a full-time job in many times, <laughs> as Fabian knows, uh, and, I, and it has a reason why this has become so, so hard. So uh, OpenStack deployment is made up of a bunch of different processes, each one doing a very specific functionality for a very specific subsystem. For example, there is uh, one process or a set of processes that are just running a REST API for the networking virtualization. There is another process that is only in charge of making the decision of what server should be running which virtual machine and all that. And all those services communicate each other through uh, standard REST APIs or asynchronous, uh, asynchronous messaging. This, uh, this model, and the, uh, sorry, and the code, another important factor is the code for all these processes is distributed among different projects and repos. OpenStack uh, has currently about 40 functional team projects, which is group of people that are in charge of one specific system, networking, uh, block devices, compute, and so on. And code is uh, distributed, split into different projects. Right now we have, as I said, uh, 40 projects and more than 400 repos. Each one of these repos has its own dependencies, its own packages, and etc. This model has, has proved to be pretty powerful in terms of flexibility and granularity for deployment. So every single admin can make the decision of what services they want to enable, what options, what drivers, what the size of each process, what uh, they, can, they can scale horizontally those processes. And also in terms of the contribution models. So we don't have, we uh, Splitting this, the code between all these repos make easy for people to join a specific projects where they have the knowledge and the permissions to work in instead of have a big monolithic project. 
the bad, the bad part of, of this model is that uh, managing uh, uh, yeah, managing a, a installation of OpenStack requires a lot of knowledge and a lot of orchestration to deploy. You need to know which packages you need to install, which order do you need to deploy stuff, the dependencies between, between services. All that complexity uh, has been traditionally out of the main project, has been managed by a tool on top of the, of the main project, which is the deployment tools or the installers. I don't want to forget any important. Okay. We'll be back. Okay, so what has happened over the last 10 years, which is more or less the time that OpenStack has been around, is that there have been a bunch of different projects, a bunch of different installers driven by different reasons. Okay, for example, some project has been tied to a specific configuration management tools. There was an OpenStack Chef, well, already it's still around. OpenStack Chef, OpenStack Puppet, OpenStack uh, Ansible, as someone was asking before. Uh, some other project has been very close to other technologies, for example, to containers, to Docker or Postman containers. And some installers were very close to Linux distribution. For example, Canonical uh, has their own set of charms intended to be used with Juju uh, or Fuel by sometime driven by Miriam. So uh, there was like every uh, ecosystem or every part of OpenStack has been creating their own management tool or their own installer. In the case of Red Hat, uh, the, in the very early days, we were driven different projects, moving from project to project, Packstack, which is around for very specific use case. We had some plugins for Foreman, and finally in 2015, if I remember correctly, Red Hat decided to join Triple O. That has, was an installer that had been created by HP, which at that time was investing hard on, on OpenStack. The idea of Triple O was using the OpenStack code to deploy OpenStack. So that's what the name comes, OpenStack on OpenStack. That was a cool idea and has been serving well during the last almost eight years or so. Uh, it has its own caveats or issues and it has been evolving over time, but it has been working well. But during this time, Kubernetes, we have a new friend in the neighborhood which was Kubernetes, and uh, as with the data I, I gave you before about the, the processes and how the architecture of OpenStack, this is a small project loosely coupled through, API, through APIs with a stateless, mainly a stateless nature, seems to be a good, a good suit, suitable application to be running as a cloud native, cloud native application, which is what Kubernetes do well and is what has been doing in the, in the last year. So since almost Kubernetes appeared, there has been a lot of discussions around if OpenStack should run on top of Kubernetes, if it was a good idea, if not. Actually, we are not the first or the only ones in things about it. There is already a project, which is OpenStack Helm, which is doing something like that, and other private companies have been doing, have been doing the same. So this year, uh, it was Red Hat or the OpenStack team at Red Hat made the, a decision that it was the time to start at least trying it and moving to a new deployment model, replacing the triple O installer or deployment tool because I'm saying installer is probably too short, but management tool to replace triple O by a new approach, which is using Kubernetes to manage and to deploy the entire life cycle of the OpenStack. Uh, installation, uh, or especially a control plane, I will go over that later. So, uh, sorry. Okay, I lost. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so last, uh, last year Red Hat decided to go for it and to create a new, a new, a new project which is based on, on Kubernetes operators. So once we have decided that uh, Kubernetes is the way to go as platform manager or orchestration for, to deploy OpenStack, the next question is what's the right way to do it, what's the right way to automate the deployment of, of OpenStack on, on OpenShift or Kubernetes because I don't know how familiar you are with Kubernetes, I, but Kubernetes provides a lot of automation to do pretty simple things like starting a container, uh, injecting configuration file in that container, uh, uh, specifying the resources that we want for a container to be able to run, communicate each other or expose out of the cluster. But to deploy a complex application, you usually need more than that. You need to combine all those Kubernetes native elements to compose a much bigger service which is made of tens of processes, services, connections, and so on. To do that, to do that orchestration, there are different tools. One is, for example, Helm that I mentioned before, and the other one is Kubernetes operators. The idea of Kubernetes operators is to create a automate engineer or administrator for your application. So if you want to create a, a, a operator, for example, to manage your uh, database database uh, installation on Kubernetes, you are creating, we are creating a, a, a database administrator as code. That's the idea. And that code run, runs inside Kubernetes. So it's a program running in Kubernetes taking care of managing and other programs running in Kubernetes. That's the idea of Operator. It's a, it's a great idea and it's super powerful. It's more complex than other approaches, but it's also much more powerful. <sighs> to go a bit deeper into, into Operators, Operators have two different parts. The first part is the is a CR, CRDs, custom resource definition, which is a way, a way to specify the details of your application. It's a, a description of the, all the aspects of your application that you want the user to be able to tune or to manage. And that is installed and configured in a Kubernetes cluster as an extension to the API. So when you install an operator, you get the Kubernetes API extended to have semantics specific for your application, for your OpenStack, for your DB, for whatever you want. So you, start, you can manage your application with the, the same tools, uh, the same processes that you manage the rest of any other Kubernetes object. Actually, the way that users interact with operators is by creating a custom resource, which is an object of the custom resource definition type. It's like the objects and instances that the idea share this and shares. The second element of an operator is the piece of code that knows how to translate the, uh, this custom resource definition or the application the application requirements in terms of Kubernetes objects. Okay, so it not, okay, if a user is asking me to create a three nodes database, for example, I need to create three, uh, three containers which are com communicate each other and inject the required configuration in all those containers. These processes are usually called controller, are, are running continuously a control loop and trying to, reconci to reconcile the status, the desired status declared in the in the CR with the existing status, okay? So this is the idea of, of operators. For the ones that are familiar with OpenShift, a big amount of what is done when you install, do a simple installation of OpenShift is running as operators on top of Kubernetes. As this project, uh, there was no project to manage OpenStack on uh, Kubernetes using operators. Red Hat decided to create their own project. This project is called OpenStack Kubernetes Operators. It's hosted in GitHub, following the standard processes, the PRs workflow, and so on. And it's tested on, it's tested, uh, on, on op currently in, in OpenShift, okay? 
this is expected to be, or this, no, it's not expected, this will be the base of the next generation of Red Hat OpenStack platform. This is public, so there is a link to the, to the, to the announcement of this from Red Hat, from this Red Hat OpenStack services on OpenShift. And the expected advantages of this as compared with previous model is that the main idea is that we get all the advantages, all the uh, features that Kubernetes are providing automatically in, in OpenStack, in OpenStack management. So for example, we get all the security between services, all the scalability, all the, uh, uh, all the observability features that Kubernetes is providing, we are automatically getting in, in for, to administer or to manage OpenStack. Uh, until now, we have been managing, or we have been creating an ad hoc tool, and at some point reinventing the wheel. And at, with this change, we are adopting a, what we understand is a standard tool to run this kind of application as base. We also hope that uh, processes like upgrades, updates, or even reconfiguration become easier. Uh, the, uh, the experience for the operator will be improved as compared to with triple O. Okay, so OpenStack operators. Each operator has its own architecture, let's say, and OpenStack operator ha has their own specificities. Specificity, yeah. Specificity. So I will explain, this is the high level architecture for the operators. I think the best way to understand or to explain is from bottom up. So starting from the blue part, this is the OpenStack services itself, what the user, the OpenStack services is using to create their own, their own uh, virtual machines, virtual networks, and so on. An OpenStack installation can be split or can be understood as two different parts. One is the control plane. The control plane are the processes that has the logic to expose the API to decide which server is going to run which virtual machine. Most part of the logic in OpenStack, the complex part, let's say, is running in this control plane and made up of many services, many processes. All those processes are the one running inside Kubernetes, inside Open, uh, OpenShift, okay? To run each service, there is a single low-level operator which defines a specific CRD, a, specific, a specification for that service, for Nova, for Neutron, Okay, and manage that small set of services. So we have one operator for each one of those services. And on top of that, we have a meta operator which takes care of orchestrating the different low level operators and defines a top level CRD that defines the whole, the entire installation, that describes the entire installation of the control plane, which services are enabled and so on. So that, that's the main entry point for the cloud admins of the cloud operators. So that's the first part of the, of the OpenStack, which is the control plane. The, the second part is the data plane, and that's a bit tricky. Uh, the data planes are the servers, the hypervisors that are running the actual load for users, the virtual machines mainly, it may be load balancers or whatever, depending on your installation, but are the ones running the user, the cloud user uh, loads, workloads. Those, it's important to understand that those servers are not part of the OpenShift or Kubernetes cluster. That's external to the cluster, but managed from the cluster. That's why we call them external data plane. Actually, those servers are running their CentOS 9 or RHEL 9. They are not running CoreOS operating system as OKD. They are running CentOS 9. And to manage those services, those, uh, all those services can be installed from bare metal, can be reconfigured and are prepared from uh, another operator, which is the data plane operator, which is running inside, uh, inside OpenShift. And it co communicates through uh, using Ansible, an Ansible execution environment to the, to the external data plane nodes. Uh, to finish, uh, of course, to run both Kubernetes uh, operators and OpenStack, we need two different set of container images. The ones for OpenStack are creating from RDO RPMs. That's our role here. I had to put the logo. And the, the, the ones that the operators are using are created by the OpenStack Kubernetes operator project directly. Okay? More or less clear? We will see. 
Okay, so that's uh, the explanation about what operators are. Now Carolina is going to explain us what have we been doing in the last months related to this and what's our plan in next next months, okay? And also, how can you test, or for anyone interested in that, how can take a look into that? Does anyone has any experience with deploying RDO? Any? Okay, eight, one, one. Yeah, we have. <laughs> okay, nice. Well, first of all, we would like to deploy, uh, provide a deployment tool for our community. We often get a question, how can I deploy RDO? How, what would you recommend for it? And we used to answer triple O for that. But since you already know, deploy is uh, EO now, end of life. So we need to fulfill the gap somehow. That's why we want to use this deployment to be our deployment tool for our community. Secondly, we want to use it to test the entire RDO. Of course, for now, we have a pack stack, we have puppet, op puppet, uh, puppet scenarios to test it, but we would like something more. We would like the whole deployment with, uh, with an uh, effect of having a voting job, if the deployment is okay or not okay. And secondly, uh, we would like to test the entire project, the OpenStack case operator, with cases which are not covered yet. For example, we are not testing in any automated way uh, new versions of OKD. As far as I know, there, are, there were release of new version uh, lately of OKD, and well, we would like to use our deployment to test it. Uh, very short about OKD. I know you heard it, but I would like to make this presentation standalone, so very shortly. OKD is the community distribution of Kubernetes that powers Red Hat OpenShift. Distribution of this distribution is optimized for continuous application development and multi-tenant deployment. Uh, it embeds Red Hat, Open, uh, Red Hat codes and it extended with some security uh, ideas and with some concepts of integration to make life, easy, make life easier. OKD itself called, uh, called itself a sibling of Kubernetes distribution to Red Hat OpenShift, and it runs on uh, CentOS CoreOS, uh, CentOS CoreOS image or Fedora CoreOS image as a base operation system. So for very short, OKD is a community distribution of OpenShift. Uh, let's introduce you to the actual, actual architecture of our proof of concept and the tooling. Our testing environment was a virtual machine. Quite powerful virtual machine because it needed at least 100 gigabytes of disk space, 32 gigabytes of RAM, and 16 virtual CPUs. We make some efforts to maybe try on a, some weaker machine with less resources, but we but more, a lot of errors occur at that time. So it's, at least it has to be uh, as requirements as, as I said. Of course, this deployment has to be, can also be performed on a, on a bare metal, on your local machine, on a, on a server. Uh, but in our case, we test it well on a, on a virtual machine. As you may see, the whole deployment is a Con contains two kinds of virtual machines. You can see that control plane is deployed on CRC VM. Inside, this is the OKD cluster, and beside it, there is an external data plane, VM or VMs, because there can be a multiple extended data planes. Be be between them, there is a layer of networking. The more, most important tools in this tooling uh, in this deployment is a CRC. A CRC is a acronym for code ready containers, and this is a very small, tiny OpenShift cluster. Well, not that tiny, it's 100 gigabytes. But, um, yep, it works quite nice. And, um, and we used uh, OC and customized to interact with this, uh, with this cluster. On the virtualization layer, we used KVM and, and libvirt. 
And optionally, we use TCIB for building custom containers. We use AJ proxy to provide uh, access from your local machine or wherever to the uh, OpenShift cluster. And another background for OpenStack services like Ceph or whatever you need for your services. Uh, please keep in mind that all these deployments are for development purposes only and are not intended for, uh, for a production yet. Okay, the diagram shows the sequence of the operation to install the deployment. So we are starting with installing the proof of concept tooling and all the requirements like cloning, uh, install YAMS repository, installing Golang and all the stuff like that. We described it in the documentation. Then we move to actual installation of, uh, of uh, code-ready containers. And having it running, we can move to the optional step. Because if you decide to make a slightly different than default deployment, we need, you need to provide your custom containers. And here is a place for TCIB to, to provide those containers. Next, it's time to deploy OpenStack operators. And what's important, those operators are intended to be independent from the OpenStack release. So with this version of the operators, you can both install Antelope, Bovcat, or whatever you want. That's an idea of those operators. Next, we are moving to deploying OpenStack control plane, as uh, Alfredo showed on, the, on, 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 uh, on his diagram. Moving to, uh, later to data plane, and separately you deploy the VM for a data plane, and then actually the resource. And here, there are two ways of, of operating with it, because if you decide to make an antelope, which is the default, which is the default one, you simply use the operator. But if you decide to make something more exaggerated, like Bobcat, you need to define your own custom resources. And at that point, you should have a running deployment. You can validate it with another operator, which is spawning the machine and pinging it. And at this point, I would like to mention some issues we have, because I mentioned that we had a deployment on a virtual machine. And the virtual machine has some uh, layer of virtualization made by Quimo. And we discovered that we had the failures with this operator with pinging the machine. And in the end, it appears that the VM is just spawning very slowly. And after some time at pinging the machine, it was all okay, it was accessible for ICMP, but at the, the, the moment of running the operator, it was not. So be careful for that, because if you, if you try to reproduce that, you may occur that issue, but we don't expect it on, uh, on the bare metal. Uh, here is a short, uh, short exp uh, example of uh, custom resources. Let me show you the file. Okay, here is a repository we created for the purposes of the deployment, the RG artifacts. There are some improvements for a, for a base project and some CRDs. And here you may see the uh, custom resource for OpenStack control plane. Two importance here. Uh, Yeah, there are definitions for all the OpenStack uh, services, like here you have, for example, Glance, Keystone, and stuff like that. Later, with, uh, as the deployment is going, we are modifying it because this is, a, uh, uh, this is the base. We can modify it with a customize. And going back to the presentation, It, you may see there are some additional options here. For example, I was doing some tests with Ceph. So to doing, doing a Ceph, Ceph, Ceph on Bobcat. So first of all, you need to define your own image, which is uh, the, 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 custom, the custom container uh, based on Bobcat. And additional field, which, is not, which was not on the file I showed you before, is a custom service config. And this, is, this, this field is proposed for overwriting the default, uh, default ser OpenStack service configuration. Here you can see the enablement of Ceph. Okay, so far so good. Uh, you, can all you can reproduce all what we worked until this time. So early enthusiasts are very welcome to test and we will appreciate any feedback you can provide us if you would like to test it. We documented all our work on uh, six CentOS documentation. 
you will, provide, you will find there all the very details, uh, cookbooks, how to, how to deploy it, well, all the tips and stuff to prepare. We started all the journey with deploying and improving the base deployment on Antelope on OKD. Antelope is a default one, so it wasn't that easy. We make some, uh, some improvements and it just worked. But later, we decided to make something slightly more difficult. We need a Bobcat, and we need another releases, which will be useful for, uh, for testing, in, or testing the RD world as a whole. So it was slightly more difficult because we need to provide our own containers and push it to the local registry. Later, we, need to, we discovered that we need to create these custom resources I showed you before. Uh, to, be, to, to, be, uh, to be used for the deployment. Yeah, but after some tests, after some, some struggling, yeah, it is, it is done now and it's all is possible to test. Later, we create a custom CRC bundle based on uh, of CentOS CoreOS image. It's only CRC now, CRC bundle. It's not the whole deployment yet, but it's our, our roadmap to achieve it. Yeah, and to make some clear, mark, small clarification on that, we've been able to run CRC on uh, OKD preset. So actually it works. Uh, we created some jobs to build TCIB containers on some RDO events. So this is a first step to making a deployment on uh, every release you wanted. We enabled some additional services like Horizon, used HAProxy to access and actually see quite nice dashboard for, for deployment. And we experiment some other OpenStack services which are not in a base deployment. And what we are working on, well, there is a, still a lot of work ahead of us, uh, but from a user, from a community perspective, we would like to provide a hands-on documentation which will be provided with some health handy instructions. For example, how, you, how can you configure your OpenStack services? How can you enable heat and make a dashboard horizon? And stuff like that, just the usage, not only the cookbook, how you can install it. And from our RDO distribution perspective, we would like to add support for OKD in CI framework. CI framework is a project for bootstrap development and CI environments for OpenStack and OpenShift. And this is something which is very, will be very important for us because this is actually a replacement for a triple O. So in the end, we would like to have uh, new containers, which I already have uh, the jobs, and also the full deployment with external data plane. And in the end, we would like to run OpenStack operators on our custom CRC bundles. Okay, thank you for the attention. If you have any questions for us, we are here for you. And also you can find us on uh, RDO channel on IRC. Thank you. Questions? Right. Hey. <laughs> I have a lot of questions for you. Uh, I'll ask three of them just in a row. They kind of, they're kind of related. Uh, first one, th that sample deployment that you showed with the VM, uh, the 100 gig VM, uh, how long did that take to, to deploy? Approximately. Well, there is a lot of manual steps to do, but deployment itself doesn't look that much. So I would say, I don't know, you can, you can make it in half an hour. So, so the, the question is how it takes me or how I take to the operators? <sighs> <laughs> it's different so far. So uh, currently, this is in a very early stage, okay? This is super active, like as Carolina said, is for early enthusiasts. So uh, this POC setup uh, has some manual processes to deploy CRC. The whole, the whole deployment doing the manual steps and so on, it takes, I don't know, uh, one hour, something like that maybe. It takes, for example, uh, the CRC deploy, which is starting the, the OpenShift node, it takes, about, in a virtual machine, it takes about 15 minutes, I would say. It depends on your connection, because it's pulling some images. Yeah. Oh, I see. And, and but for example, deploying 
OpenStack with the operator is super fast. So that's one of the of the advantages of this as compared with with our previous solution. So it's much faster the actual deployment of, of, of OpenStack once you have your CR ready, your you you ask OpenShift to start your installation, it's really fast. I is uh, me in minutes you have your control plane ready. For the data plane, obviously, if you are doing bare metal deployment, because you could do bare metal deployment using, like, uh, well, metal cube. If you use bare metal deployment, obviously, it needs to uh, install operating system in all your data plane nodes. It will take more time. We have been using pre-installed virtual machines, which is also another, I don't know, five, ten minutes to deploy. Oh, th thank you. Uh, the, uh, the, the sluggishness that you noticed in that, Deployment was it because I didn't understand that part? Was that because it, was that a nested virtualization yeah. issue? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, and then finally, so OpenStack supports other hypervisor platforms of VMware. Uh, does RDO only support KVM at this time? Yeah. And but will will it do more in the future? Oh, that's it. Actually, we use less. So we used to have more in the past. Let's say in this way. So no, we uh, we don't have any. I mean, it it may be if there would be interest and community around it. Uh, our findings during these ten years is that most people was interested in KVM, and that's what they have been using. Uh, hi. So when this new way of deployment will be in production, like very stable and so on, hopefully soon. Um, do you have any idea what you will do to your users to help them to migrate from the old way of provisioning to the new way of provisioning? Yeah, so if I understand the question is how to migrate from previous model, triple O, to new model. So uh, I can give you some the ideas, the ideas that we have. There is The idea is to have a, a adoption, external data plane adoption method which will take the existing compute nodes, will connect to the new control plane deployed on this new system. So the high level idea is to, we will create a new, a new OpenStack control plane installation. We will dump the database probably, I just high level, there is some detail, but deploy the high level and we'll point the compute nodes to use this new control plane. So virtual machines workload keep running and keep and touch in the existing uh, in the existing hypervisors, but uh, control plane is new new control plane installation. Let's say this way. This understood. I hope it's not an embarrassing question, but these days Don't do it. everything is converging and merging together. And I see that, of course, it makes sense to just try to go to OpenShift way. But then, um, how do you see the future of RDO and OpenStack if you rely on OpenShift when OpenShift can then deploy virtual machine with the kubevert or OpenShift virtualization inside OpenShift directly? Because, of course, it overlaps. Yeah, well, yes and no. Uh, so there are several questions. From uh, RDO itself, uh, we are the same that we have been since we was created. This, so we have always been a distro of RPMs. So uh, installers are a different projects. All have been triple O. This is new project. We have like symbiotic relationship. We provide RPMs that they need. They provide us with a deployment tool that we need to test and our users need. So that's from that fr about uh, OpenStack and KubeVirt or OpenShift virtualization. At this point, I think they are still covering different kind of customers of different kind of use cases. What we are seeing in OpenStack, I would say that the existing install base of OpenStack is pretty strong and they are really uh, leveraging OpenStack API, API sorry, uh, OpenStack APIs and features that have been developed uh, over years, for example, in the telco. The telco is for a, a great case because there has been a lot of effort on putting specific features for, for telcos in, in OpenStack that KubeVirt or OpenShift virtualization at this point is not able to do. 
also uh, open open also open stack provides some other services not only virtual machines that are also more mature i would say in open stack that in open virtualization as future i don't know <laughs> i cannot say who will uh, i my perspective is as customers or users require big deployments of virtual machines open in, in multi-tenancy mode open stack will still be there if virtual machine is like a very uh, niche case, niche niche case yeah niche case is case in a world of containers then kubevirt is probably the nice the the perfect solution because it joins uh, containers and virtual machines that's how i see it thank you Hey, uh, quick question. Um, I heard you using nested virtualization, and there is often a um, confusion there when people say nested virtualization. It can mean two things, KVM on KVM or KVM on pure emulation. Which are you using? Okay, because so I, uh, I will. So we are using a KVM virtual machine. Actually, it's an open stack virtual machine. In that virtual machine, that's the POC node. So we are running KBM, KBM inside this virtual machine. So the compute node is a KBM virtual machine. So the virtual machines, the open stack instances there are KEMU emulated. So we have yeah. three, so that's... that's so uh, nested is enabled on the bare metal? Exactly. And on the level one VM is KVM? And the, then exactly. Yeah, because Ex oftentimes the, a lot of bugs come when KVM on the bare metal um, but the first level VM is emulated TCG. Yeah, no, then there comes a lot of errors. Another place where comes problems is when you're running completely different versions of kernels on bare metal and the level one. So a lot of issues can be resolved if possible, because a lot of times it's not possible because you're getting the bare metal host from a cloud vendor, like an upstream yeah. open stack CI. So if the bare metal kernel and the level one kernel are almost close, then you will not hit uh, as many. I, I think this is the case. I mean, in this, well, we can go into detail later, but I think this is the case. We have pretty close kernel in the first and second level, but yeah, there is a third level, and that's running QEMU virtualized, and yeah, virtual machines takes quite long to boot. Hi, I was curious about, do you all use or plan to use metal, metal cubes with these operators for bare metal? Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll try. I'll try. So the idea, I, uh, to be honest, I didn't test it yet. But the idea is that we will use metal cube, the metal cube running in, in OpenShift, to deploy the external data plane nodes. Okay. So that's what we, right? <laughs> what we'll be, we will be using to deploy the, the compute node. So you know, metal cube is using ironic under the hood and all that machinery. So that's the that's the idea, okay. So actually, that's something that was not supported. To be clear, that's in in a standard OpenShift cluster was not supported to use metal cube to nodes which are not part of the cluster. But we are extending it to use it to use it that way. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much.